Bank, it's me great pleasure to welcome the Chair for this evening, Professor Hugh Spikes. Hugh graduated in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge in 1968 and obtained his PhD for research in lubrication from Imperial College in 1972. After a long career in teaching and research at Imperial College, he is currently the Emeritus Professor in Mechanical Engin Engineering Department and Head of the Tribology Group at the College. He has been involved in research in tribology for over 40 years and has received a number of recognitions for his research achievements, including in 2004 the Tribology Trust Tribology Gold Medal, the highest international honour in tribology. Professor Spike's research interests range from across the breadth of tribology, from friction and wear of machine components such as gears and bearings, through the lubrication of micro machines, to improved hair conditions and skin creams. That's quite a wide range. I'm quite impressed with this and really looking forward to the lecture. He has a particular interest in how the molecular properties of liquid lubricants determine their ability to form separating films between rubbing surfaces and thus to reduce friction and wear. And of course, Hugh is our chair, so I won't be talking about this, but I'm sure they'll come in somewhere. So if you'd like to uh, join me in welcoming Professor Hugh Spikes, I'll now hand over to him. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker here, um, Dr. Ian Bell. Um, he obtained an honours degree and a doctorate in chemistry from the University of Edinburgh, and he hasn't given a date, unlike me, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. He's, he's worked in the petrochemical in industry for 17 years, all in research and development, and mainly, as is his subject today, focused on automotive lubricants. In fact, he's worked for both the additive and the oil companies, and um, Ian will explain the difference between additive and oil companies in his talk, I think. Um, he's authored many pa patents and papers. Um, since 2008, Ian has been research and um, R&D director for engine oils at Afton Chemical. Um, Afton is an international company and he spends 30% of his time abroad, um, mainly in the US where the company headquarters are. On a personal note, Ian used to be a serious oarsman, apparently, but sadly the arrival, no, happily, the arrival of a son three years ago means that he's now a serious Lego specialist. Um, and it's worth noting that um, he used to be trained as an opera singer, a bass opera singer which is very good for getting his son to sleep in the evening, but we hope won't be so good for getting you to sleep this evening, we trust. Anyway, I'd like to welcome Ian Bell, who's going to be talking Slippery Secrets. Thank slippery you Secrets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. And thank you all for taking the time uh, to come and join us this evening. I am... Um, somewhat humbled to be here that, uh, well, one, you all spend the time to come and listen to me talk, but also being a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemists, to get an opportunity to come here and speak uh, here is uh, really quite special. So thank you to uh, the RSC for giving me that opportunity. I did think when I telling my friends and my family I was going to the RSC uh, and I had an invitation and I was headlining the stage this evening, they did confuse it with uh, Sir Ian McKellar and uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, <laughs> and uh, I had to correct them. However, I do hope that uh, I can entertain you, uh, perhaps not the same way as uh, Sir Ian would. Though. So what do I want to do? I hope I can give you some kind of information that you'll take away, you'll enjoy uh, learning, and the purpose of these lectures is to impart knowledge and share some of the uh, insights that we have. But I do hope that we can do this in a way that's not dull. So in your feedback forms, you should have a category there, dull, yes or no. So my challenge is to try and make this as lively as possible. I would say, when people ask at dinner parties, what do you do, Ian? I was like, oh, I make things up. Because generally, in a five minute uh, opportunity to explain what I do, doesn't come across as sharp. But we've got 45 minutes, so I can spend a little bit of time to try and make it more engaging. Interesting, and as I said, I'll try and make it entertaining. 
So I'll explain a little bit of who Afton are my uh, employer and what we do and how we fit into the, this picture of uh, lubricant. I'll also give you, I said a crash course, just a broad insight into the, the chemistry of lubricants and specifically the lubricant additives uh, that we develop, manufacture, and supply. There are lots of challenges that uh, we try and overcome in what we do, and I'll describe some of those to you. But I'll focus on one, particularly around emissions reduction, which is something I think that echoes uh, and resonates with most people as you walk around the streets and you see so many vehicles uh, around the city. And then, of course, we've got some questions at the end. So save them up to the end. Afton Chemical, we are one of four global additive suppliers. And I'll explain what an additive supplier is in the context of the lubricants industry. But we've been around a long time. There are names, ethyl, some people will recognize. Um, that is nil, still part of our uh, holding companies suite of companies, but Afton Chemical is the part of the organization I work for. They develop chemicals for use in lubricants, be that engine oils, transmission fluids, but also for fuel additives, gasoline and diesel. I would say, I've got into the way of saying gasoline. That means petrol. But our colleagues, being an American company, an American-centric, US-centric industry, Petrol becomes gasoline. So I apologize for the uh, Americanisms. I find it difficult to avoid. So the company, as you said, it's a true international organization. We have 1,400 people roughly spread around the world, manufacturing sites in three different continents, research sites in three continents. It's a substantial entity. Not as big as the big oil companies, the BPs, the Exxons, who are essentially our customers. But no, it's a big organization. And it is, as the name says, we're Afton Chemical, we're a chemical company. Cuts through the middle, we think chemically. So to Hugh's point, to try and explain the difference between additive suppliers and oil companies, and I see people with cash flow badges on, so I'm going to be held to task here if I get anything wrong. We have additive suppliers like ourselves, we make chemicals, and I'll explain those in subsequent uh, uh, moments through the talk. We have lubricant marketers, and that is the companies that you know very well. The big brands, these uh, very uh, well-known companies, the BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, or ESO, um, and also smaller organizations, the regional ones, Fuchs, Petronas, down to even smaller national organizations and regional oil companies. There's a whole plethora of uh, oil companies, but hold it in your mind, when you talk about lubricant marketers, think BP, think Shell. That's what we're talking about. We also have vehicle makers. Why is that important? Well, this is the chemistry that goes into the lubricants that these uh, organizations then sell to vehicle manufacturers. And then, we have the end user, here's some of our Lego view, that this one doesn't use lubricants. It's uh, the end user, you all, everyone who has a, a vehicle here, fit into this category. And whether you are buying it a lubricant directly from Shell or BP or whether it's from Tesco's, or whether you're buying it via the oil company in the shape of the oil that comes with your car when you buy it, or when you take it to the, uh, the workshop and they fill your vehicle with lubricant, you're the this end of the value chain. We are kind of over here. So hopefully, a little bit clearer, that's what we're going to be talking about here. But there's a great deal of overlap between the additive suppliers and the lubricant manufacturers because we work very, very closely. We can't do our uh, research and development in isolation from them. They're our customers. Similarly, they are very, very knowledgeable um, organizations, and they too have a part to play in how we use additives 
So it's a very synergistic relationship. And that feeds again through in oil uh, companies, additive companies, with the vehicle makers. We, we work with them, helping them develop new vehicles and new technologies and the lubricants that are needed to uh, support those. So what is on the bottle? Just a quick show of hands. How many people change their oil in their car routinely? Thank you very much, sir. Three. Now, that is not atypical. Most people don't. I don't. Most people take the car into the garage as part of the service to get the lubricant changed. Absolutely normal. Perfect. But we seldom see people really understanding what's on the ball. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of it, but there's some things here, SE5W30. That te that's a viscosity grade, as we call it. Tells you how runny it is. And there's producer, whether that's Fuchs or whoever, a brand name, and it's something, something tells you something about the lubricant. So you get a feel for roughly what it is. But then on the back of it, there's a bunch of gibberish. Now, I say, I, I can deconvolute this. I can work out what this means. And to a certain extent, you know, for the next few slides, I'll explain to you how we make that gobbledygook into something that's relevant for technologists. But these are essentially approvals that this lubricant has attained. It's a certain quality level, and it describes a specific quality level that has been tested for this lubricant, and they can put that on the bottle. So it is uh, important, gentlemen who change your oils yourself, to make sure you get the right variant, because there's many of them, make sure you get the right variant for your vehicle. And you do that by looking in your user's manual. So, we've got all this gobbledygook in the back of the, the can. What do you do with it? Where do we get to science? Well, let me explain where this gobbledygook comes from. See, this is where people drift off at the dinner table. Thankfully, you can't go anywhere. It starts off with legislation, primarily. <coughs> Driving down as we'll get to further on in the talk, reducing emissions, reducing um, particulates going into the atmosphere from the exhaust of the vehicle. These legislations constantly pushing down the limits. That means that there's design changes in the vehicles. They have to change how they make vehicles and how they make uh, engines and how they run to accommodate those uh, reduced limits that are driven by legislation. What that means then, subsequently, we get these industry specifications that are set up, that are ever increasingly challenging, that uh, we then have to prove our oils against. So let me just flip back. These are the industry specifications. Some of them, that's BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, these are car manufacturer specific. But we also have some down here, API or ASEA, which are generic industry specifications. So there's a whole host of them. So we have these specifications. And still, we haven't got to the level that's actually useful for technologists. To prove ourselves and prove these oils against these specifications, there are standard in industry uh, tests that are developed. These are usually fully fired static engines. So if it's for passenger car use, these will be uh, an inline four engine, a two liter engine or a 1.6 liter engine that are run to standard conditions, repeatable conditions with a pass fail criteria dependent on what parameter you're looking at. So it might be wear. You don't want your engine to wear out. So you might set up an engine to run in a way that challenges the wear of uh, a certain engine with lubricant. It might be, can your lubricant keep an engine clean? You can run engines to probe that. Standard conditions that are run repeatably and reproducibly uh, that allow us to test our engine. So that's essentially our pass-fail criteria. Now, for each specification, five, six, eight different engines, all of which you have to pass. You can't just pass one and you're okay. So there's a whole range of balancing performance requirements uh, 
that the formulator needs to address. So we've now got legislation, changing engines, which drive specifications that give us these standard tests that you need to pass. So when I look at the gobbledygook in the previous page, I start thinking, oh, so that means it's got a VW TDI engine in it, or, or it's got a Mercedes 271. I then go from specification to engine. The next step is to take, how do we then go from engine to chemistry? And that is what we do. So thankfully, we've now gone past the sleeping stage at the dinner table, and we can go and talk about actually how we go about doing this. So we have a can of oil. What's in there? As you'd expect, there's oil. It's not all oil. Now, we have, I said, 75 to 80% of the, uh, the can is oil. Viscosity modifier. I'll explain what that is in subsequent slides, but it's essentially a polymer that controls how runny the oil is. You want to have it runny, but not too runny. 5%, 10%, depending on how runny you want it. And then that leaves 10 to 15% that is actually chemistry. That's what we put in. So there's a lot of oil, polymer for physical and performance uh, reasons, and then the chemistry, I'll explain why we put that in, the chemicals make up about 15% of the, 10 to 15% of the can of oil. So when you're buying a can of oil, it isn't just oil. There's, we, we could put chemistry inside in an Intel kind of way. But why do we need additives? Why isn't oil good enough? Why can't we just use oil? Initially, that's exactly what we did. Not we, I wasn't born. A long time ago, oil was exactly what people used for lubricating their engines and their cars. But as, again, legislation uh, drove down requirements, and even earlier, users' expectations. They wanted cars to be faster and more powerful. We uh, required the use of chemistry. So, what does an engine oil do? It is a load-bearing fluid. It reduces friction. So load-bearing, essentially, it's stopping metal parts rubbing against one another. And in doing so, well, it's a, a load-bearing fluid. Reducing friction. You don't want it fluid, uh, sorry, you don't want the metal parts running against one another with metal-metal contact because it's high friction, you're losing energy. You want it to be nice and slippy. You want it to be a highly efficient vehicle. You want to have a lubricant in there. That's quite obvious. It's also a heat transfer agent. Engines are very, very hot. I know we have engineers in the room. You can tell us how hot they are. Very hot. That is a turbocharger running. Okay, it's got the lights out in the, the cell, but it's running red hot. It's not too difficult to do that. Turbochargers are one of the most uh, severely thermally challenged parts of an engine. So how do we manage heat? What does heat do to a lubricant? We've got to account for that. And we do that in a number of ways. So we add lubricant additives to either protect the base oil so it continue doing what it's meant to do, or we add additives to further enhance the properties of a lubricant uh, fluid, so a base oil. Or we add chemistry to overcome some of the shortcomings that the lubricant, additive, uh, the lubricant fluid might have. So base oils. We talk about base oils. This is a group of fluids that are highly refined. Uh, in some uh, cases, they are synthetic in nature. These are, as I said, the carrier fluid, but the majority of uh, what you buy in your can of oil. 
but it's not just a homogenous, it's not just a, a single entity. In many cases, there is a mix of materials in there. And you have to stop thinking about them as just an oil. It's all chemistry. These are chemicals. They might be relatively inert, but you can describe them chemically. And when you think about them chemically, you can start exploiting them chemically. So an example of some of the things that we do. This is a way that we look at our base oils in Athens. We use quite a acute uh, GCMS methodology that allows us to pull apart the base oils, these uh, lubricant fluids, and allows us to describe them in their chemical entity. And so this is just a little graph. You've got the carbon number here and the, uh, the breakdown of the different types of chemistry. Why is that important? Well, again, reflecting back on these being very thermally challenged engines and the lubricants flowing around them, this linear molecule is going to react completely differently to this aromatic or this uh, cyclic species. So we need to understand it. We can't just accept the face value that this is a fluid, just use it. No, it's all chemistry. And when you understand how these different entities perform differently within an engine, you can then start using additives to either enhance or protect those fluids appropriately. But in this case, we're, as I said, trying to find the structure through uh, definition of the carbon number. Viscosity modifier. I said there's about 5 to 10% of a polymer in uh, the the lubricant, the can of lubricant that you'd buy. Why do we need that polymer? Well, very simply, in a, an ideal world, a fluid, as you heat it, it gets more runny. I remember that when my mother used to do cooking with golden syrup. You heat it up to get out of the can. You take it out of the, the cupboard, and it's, you can't pour it out. It's exactly the same. You can imagine... For a vehicle in uh, startup mode, so you jump into your car, and it's a relatively cold day. So thankfully not today, maybe a month or two back. You turn the key in your, uh, your vehicle. You want the fluid to be pumping right away. You want to have a relatively low viscosity fluid. You want it nice and runny, so it pumps really quickly, gets to the parts that are in contact, and protects them right away. However, when it's up and running, and that could take you know, like 10, 50 minutes, something to get up to uh, proper operational temperature, you want it to be at the high end of the viscosity. You don't want it to be very, very runny because you want that thick film for protection. It's a load-bearing fluid. So you want the best of both worlds. We do that by adding a polymer, and we turn it into a non-Newtonian fluid. So at different temperatures, the polymer behaves differently, and you can control the viscosity between low and high temperature by choosing the right polymer and designing the right polymer for that job. So high temperature, these polymers extend out, and they get intertwined. At low temperature, you can trap back viscosity goes down. So these are designer fluids dependent on temperature. It's like walking along the street. If you're walking on Oxford Street, busy day, and you're all jostling through with your shoulders, you can get through reasonably quickly. If everybody was walking with their arms out, it's going to slow down. Oxford Street's going to be relatively viscous. So these are designer molecules. It's more than just the molecular uh, size, so how these interact within the fluid is important. And this is just an, uh, one example of some uh, research that we've done looking at how the polymers behave 
inter- and intramolecularly. What we did was we put pyrene markers on these polymers. And then by tracking how these pyrene markers came within proximity of one another, you would get a signal in the fluorescent area that you could track. So for different molecules at different temperatures, you can see and you can map how they behave. And in doing so, you can, as I said, design the polymer for the application that you need. So again, another example of actually using uh, science and uh, chemistry techniques to get below that gross scale of, oh, it's a polymer, to what polymer do you actually need? Just going to have a drink. This is just plain water. I brought a couple of props. This is another analogy that's going to, again, answer Hugh's question about additives and oils. This is how I explain to people what the additive companies do. This is what we make. Not exactly, but analogous. This is what we make. But you don't drink, well, not often, you don't drink these. What you do do is drink this. That's what you see. That's what you drink. That's your oil. And of course, that's one base fluid. There's lots of others, just as there are lots of other oils. So you need to know how to use these and use the additives together. That's how the additive companies and the oil companies work well together. Does anybody think there's any difference between Evian and a good old English Ashbeck water? Chemists would tell you they are. Just water. That's like me saying it's just water and somebody saying, oh, it's just oil. It's not just oil. Oh, here, another anecdote. There was a time about 10 years ago, so that's two litres, three and a half, two litres of water. This would cost more than two litres of engine oil in North America. How did that happen? It drove me nuts. How much chemistry is in there? I'm just busy describing to you, these are designer fluids. Between the additive companies, the oil companies, so much technology sits within the lubricant industry, and because of marketing, God bless them, they can demand more money for water than they can for lubricant. Thankfully, that's not quite the same uh, now as it was then. Hopefully, you'll be equally convinced and equally outraged by the time we finish. But anyway, there's another analogy. Does anybody want a drink of Ribena? It's a different additive system. I'm now deeply embarrassed because I, I, I made this talk before I knew that Hugh was going to be the, uh, the chairman for this. And you know, whether you're aware or not, Hugh is a like, world expert in some of the areas I'm about to talk about. So my apologies, sir, for uh, not being quite you. But <laughs> that could be a good thing. So, well, talk about wear. Wear is important. This is one of the primary reasons we put lubricants uh, into engines is to prevent engine wear. If your engine wears out, that costs money, it's time, it's a nuisance. You want to stop wearing your engine. One way of doing it, as I said in previous slides, was getting the viscosity of the lubricant good enough. But, as we'll talk about later, you want to have the lower viscosity fluids to be better for fuel efficiency and reduced uh, tailpipe CO2 emissions. So it's a balance. You want to have it really thick, but you, know, you don't want it that thick. What we're playing about with is where we sit on the famous Strybeck curve. And I said, Hugh's the expert in this, but if you'll indulge me. So we have 
a vector here, and this is the friction of coefficient, uh, friction coefficient. So that's how, uh, how much energy you're losing as things are rubbing together. And then this axis here, think of it as temperature, easiest one. It's a complex thing, but think of, just think of it as temperature. As you reduce the temperature of the lubricant under control conditions, it will be getting better, then all of a sudden you will take off and at this point you reach phenomena where the metal parts are actually beginning to interfere with one another and the friction coefficient goes up. You want it to be down here where it's nice and efficient for the lubricant and the engine to be operating. We are constantly trying to maneuver ourselves around this Strybeck curve. But in a vehicle, the contact points are innumerable. It's not just one contact point. There's cams against lifters. There's cylinder bores with pistons. And whole manner of bits of uh, metal are coming in contact with one another. So you're never in any one place. You're always in many places in this Strybeck curve. How do you control that? We use supplementary wear protection because undoubtedly there are times when we are going to be down in this part of the curve. So we add anti-wear agents to protect the metal, the metal surfaces, when we get down to those kinds of metal-metal uh, metal contacts. Some really nice pieces of bench apparatus that I mean, most of the organizations who work in the industry utilize. MTM Slim. It's essentially a ball and a disc. The disc spinning around, you've got a ball that's spinning on the top, and you have a lubricant that is in this yellow here in the depiction that just sits in here that is um, getting drawn into the contact area. And so you can change how quickly the, the disc rotates or the ball rotates, and you can uh, mimic contact conditions, different contact conditions, and establish how additives and lubricants, um, how they perform under these different conditions. And in the next slide, it's actually quite compl complicated because it's actually a glass disc. So you're shining a light through a glass disc. There's actually a spacer, and that's where the, the slim parts comes into the MTM slim. This is actually a metallic layer that reflects from the light back. So you get light coming in, goes all the way through and comes out. You get some of the light coming in and it gets reflected back. You then get an interference pattern. Start talking about physics, so I find that a little bit dangerous for me. But you have people who are really good at computing that turn it into an image. We essentially develop an image of how the additives are developing on the surface of the, uh, uh, the ball, and it uh, allows us to then map that. So this is actually an image taken from some of our work of how additives are built up on the surface of this metal, uh, this metal ball. You can then take that further, plot it in the thickness, so you can actually see where there's a thick layer, there's a thin layer. You can then look how one additive might give you a thick layer, another addi additive might give you a thin layer. It allows you to then pick what additives you use for certain conditions. It gets even better. You can then look at the chemistry. You can use analytical techniques that can probe this area where the ball has been rubbing. And you can see what molecules or what atoms are uh, embedded within that area. And from there, infer back to what's happening in terms of the chemistry that's controlling this uh, wear protection. <coughs> this is a primary anti-wear agent, zinc diacyl dithiophosphate. But this doesn't do anything other than decompose. It's a decomposition products that actually do what we actually want them to do. It's pretty complicated, though. It's a complicated 
reaction when you put a lubricant into a, an engine running at 8,000 RPM, 200 degrees Celsius, with a multitude of moving parts. There's lots of decomposition products. Which ones are the useful ones? This is a somewhat simple, simplified schematic, but what we did was we did exactly that work. This is uh, one of these engines I spoke about at the start, one of these static engines. This is uh, a North American engine, but uh, nonetheless a Ford V8. We ran a lubricant and we took samples and we traced how these different species, these ones, how these changed in their, uh, their makeup within the lubricant over time. Oops, sorry. Some of them reduce, some of them build up and then decay off, some of them build up. What we then did was then mapped how these different systems performed for wear protection, oxidation control, for frictional properties, to allow us to then infer back from which of these molecules, which of these molecules are actually active species. Again, allows us to then control how we uh, additize the, the lubricant to give us the right performance that we're, we're trying to attain. But it's not all about little spinning balls and discs. Some actually highly precise testing that we undertake. Now, if you imagine uh, slide rules, my father was an engineer, he tried to get me to understand I used micrometers and slide reels. I was terrible. Never managed to do that. That's why I ended up being a chemist and not an engineer. But there's different tools that give you different precision. What I'm going to talk about is RNT, radionucleotide testing, which essentially uses irradiated metal parts in an engine and by collecting and measuring the amount of radioactive parts going into the oil, you can establish how much wear there is a uh, occurring within the engine. This is supplied by some of our uh, friends in Germany who, who do this testing for uh, us in the industry. So we have cobalt 57, 56, so do a multitude of different isotopes. But you irradiate different parts of the engine. You then put it into the engine and you run it. And this is just, again, schematic of the equipment that they using the detectors. And as the engine runs, they follow how much cobalt-57 or cobalt-56 is built up within the oil at any given time. And they can then say, well, um, these parts of the engines are being more challenged than this part because we're seeing more 57 than we are 56. And it's real time. And it's very accurate. And it allows us to do our research in a very precise way. Now, if you Again, go back to here. I assure you that a 4.6 liter V8 Ford engine is not a precise research tool. As an R&D director, I want my team to be using precise research tools. And there's some people nodding in the room because they know what I'm talking about. This is actually a very precise tool. This is the actual output from these sorts of tests. What we get is, I don't know how many people speak German, but even I can say that that's oil temperature. But <laughs> this is uh, RPM. So as you change the speed of the engine, the temperature that the oil is uh, exposed to, you get different rates of wear within the engine. And from that, you can work out how much uh, protection is getting from the additive systems and what you have to do to try and uh, improve that. Again, this is an example from BMW, but many of the, the car manufacturers utilize this sort of methodology in their uh, specifications. And of course, you know what specifications are because that's the stuff on the back of the bottle. Here's an example. So it said BMW, whatever, on the back. This is one of the tests that support that uh, performance claim for a lubricant. And this is what it looks like in real life. You have the engine, a whole bunch of stuff that 
the engineers know how to put together to make these engines run uh, repeatedly in these conditions. And these are the uh, radioactive detectors sitting in the corner. So we spoke about anti-wear, detergents. Talk about detergents, think about fairy liquid and things. It's not too far from the truth. They are soaps, but they are so much more. And this is my first foray into uh, actual chemistry for today, which is, uh, I don't know how long we've been going, but it's quite a while before we get to the first reaction. So combustion. I keep telling the people on the team that we are dealing with reactions. It might be an engine. It might be this 4.6 uh, liter V8 Ford engine. It's a reaction. Let's think about reaction chemistries. It's simple. Think about fuel. Now, simplistically, I'm taking methane. We don't use methane, but keeping things simple. Everybody could balance that equation. So hydrocarbon, oxygen, combustion, you get CO2 and water. Everybody learns that when about 12 or before. Now, it's never as simple as that, because fuels quite often have sulfur within them, although that's getting driven down for a number of reasons. But if you put that into the mix, it gets a little bit more complicated. You get CO2, H2O. You also get these sulfur oxide species creeping in. And of course, we don't actually live in a world with just oxygen. You live in a world, it's actually air. And there's an awful lot of uh, nitrogen in there. That carries through, and you get these nitrogen oxide species. You start combining these. And you can see where I'm going. Sulfuric acid, nitric acid, that doesn't sound like a good thing to have in your engine. That's what happens when you get aqueous acids and metal combined. That's not going to make for a, a very good uh, running engine with that much rust. So how do we deal with it? Detergents. What we have is... This is schematic of detergent. You have the usual surfactants, which is the fairy liquid part, but they're surrounding a solid calcium carbonate, usually calcium carbonate, some magnesium carbonate core. So they're actually colloids. Colloid chemistry is a big factor of what we think about within uh, the lubricants industry. And some great work you can do in here. Look, characterizing uh, the, the molecules that you, you make. You get some fantastic work. Through uh, neutron scattering and x-ray scattering, you can establish the size of the core. You can establish the size of the surfactants around the outside. You can start characterizing it in great detail to allow us to then fine-tune the acid neutralization properties of these detergents versus others. Easy to model. Again, just illustrating that. In here, I apologize for those at the back, can't see I walk up. There's equal amount of calcium carbonate in each of these. So the ladies at the front will attest. It's a solid and a liquid. In here, it may not be beautifully water white, but it's a, an amber liquid. That's what colloid chemistry does for you. So we've got 25% rock and oil. You've got 25% rock in oil, and it's stable. In all of the vehicles that you all have and all the lubricants inside them, this is what's preventing your, uh, your engine rusting. These are a little bit tacky, but you can come and see them at the front if you wish. When, when I finish. We would also see we make these things at hundreds of tons scale. The process chemistry that goes along to do that is very, very impressive. You don't want to get it wrong because it means people have to get in the reactor with a shovel to dig it out. I know you're joking. It happens. Thankfully, not very often. And the other phenomenon, uh, again, rheological issues, so the mixing, rheology is the science of mixing. 
issues of Weissenberg effect, uh, effect. I had never heard of Weissenberg until you see it through a mixer. This fluid crawls up the shaft of the mixer. Phenomenon that I just cannot explain. But anyway, Weissenberg effect. All these things, these guys doing it hundreds of tons scale. Very, very impressive work. And there's lots of other stuff. Dispersants, diesel vehicles. People who ride, uh, drive diesel cars, controlling soot, particulates, all of that good stuff. High temperatures, you need antioxidants. Friction modifiers, whole range of different chemistries that we add in to give you the right performance. I'm not going to go through those. I just gave you a sample of some of the bits and pieces uh, to give you a sense of the type of chemistry that we use. And then, of course, you get to the point that we can't actually use them because the legislation says you can't. Because the N start using hardware that you can't use certain molecules. So you remember the, uh, the detergents I just spoke about? Calcium carbonate, if you burn it, you can't burn the calcium. You end up with ash. If that gets blown through your engine, you end up with uh, particulates coming out of your exhaust. That's not good for the atmosphere. So they've installed diesel particulate fil filters, DPFs. That's the type of stuff you collect from these over time. Thankfully, there's methodologies to reduce that, and uh, the car manufacturers do that. But there's a complex array of pipes underneath your vehicle, underneath where you sit, that controls the gases as they come out of your engine before they get to your tailpipe, your exhaust pipe. So not only can we, uh, do we have to reduce the amount of detergent we use because of this ash, in gasoline, petrol cars, you can't use quite as much phosphorus. Remember the zinc uh, phosphorus uh, species that were used for anti-wear protection? You can't use as much of that because it poisons the catalyst. So we have great chemistry that does great things, but then we're getting restrictions again on how we can use it. So I'm just describing here a bunch of challenges. Just one moment. This is what formulators love. And there's people here in the room who are formulators, aspire to be formulators, or used to be formulators. That's me used to be formula. Yeah? We deal with, it's like juggling with 10 balls, trying to work out how to uh, keep all these balls in the air. Or it's like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle when you don't have all the pieces and you don't know what the picture is. But somehow you've got to get the, places, uh, the pieces in the right place. There's a huge amount of uh, intellectual challenge in formulating lubricants be it on the additive side or the uh, lubricant marketer side. Designed experiments, statistics, lots and lots of uh, methodologies we use to try and simplify it, but it's a complicated stuff. And I just wanted to touch on this. This is not about the chemistry. This is about the people. One of the things uh, uh, that she said in a previous slide there's a special interest group that the RSC is uh, part of for, about formulation expertise. It's a discipline. Being a formulator is different from being a chemist. It's different from being an engineer. We recognize that. So again, the RSC is at the forefront of trying to lead that thought and how do we encourage uh, development of formulators, particularly in the UK. And these are the kind of skills and capabilities and disciplines that formulators within our industry touch on. It's not just about chemistry, but you need to work with engineers, as I said, because that's a reactor, manufacturing guys, how you scale these things up to 100 tons, but working with tribologists, esteemed tribologists, um, statisticians, HSE, health and safety, dealing with materials day in, day out, formulations, rheology, a whole plethora of areas that people touch on. Formulators do that. They understand how these things come together to give us our products. So if you know people who can do this,
come and tell us because they're very rare. They're very rare. But formulations are everywhere. As we said of you, you've worked in many areas from uh, kind of the cosmetic area, paints, chocolates, tires. It's all about formulating. It's very rare that there's one entity that you buy. Even in the uh, materials that one might wear in them, uh, the clothes that you wear, if they're synthetic, they're rarely going to be a single uh, entity. Formulating is uh, very important. The pigments, the dyes, formulation, very important. So that's the end of getting off my soapbox about formulators. Let's talk about why we do this. And this is kind of our running down to the end. Why do we do this? What are the drivers for change for an industry? Greenhouse gases, emissions, we all hear about this uh, in the news. Legislation driving down Kyoto years ago, Kyoto 2 and such like. All of this talks to reducing the environmental impact of the vehicles that we use. That is a wholly good thing. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And there's technology that's been developed to, to do that, to enable that. There are things that the, uh, the car manufacturers are trying to do to address that. We have a small part to play in uh, delivering that and enabling that and enabling them to deliver it. But this is for sure global. It's not about the UK, it's not just Europe. This is a global issue, so we have to deal with it globally. This is a chart just looking at uh, tailpipe CO2. So the, the CO2 that comes out of the exhaust of your car, what is legislation uh, doing there? It's driving it down. So different countries, USA, Canada, Japan, China, here's Europe. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a 25% reduction. The 10 years looking out, we're going to see a 50% reduction in what is going to be allowed. Now, I wholly agree, that's what we need to do. But that means that we, and the people in the industry here that uh, participate, we have a much, much bigger challenge to overcome in the next 10 years than we've been dealing with in the last 10 years. And trust me, that was hard enough. So we have to think differently. So in a vehicle, there's some numbers here that might actually shock you. This is schematic of a vehicle. Where are the energy losses? You can refer to different papers here that uh, actually describe this work uh, in more detail. But you lose things thermally. It's, there's pumping losses, losses to friction. The things to pick up, however, are the power of the wheels. Only 20% of the chemical energy that goes in via your petrol or your diesel gets to the wheels, 20%. It's not that impressive. On the other side, that's a great opportunity. If you can make a small impact there, it's significant. So 1% improvement in the energy conversion is a 20% uh, improvement in the, sorry, um, yeah, 20% improvement in the power of the wheels. But what can we do in our little corner of the, the value chain, the industry? Drive train, so this is like your gears, your, uh, how you get the power from the engine to your wheels, that's what we call the power of the drive train. There's losses there, about 3%, 4%. Then the engine, there's about 5% or so that's uh, associated with frictional losses. That's what we're talking about. 8 to 9% of the energy, that's what we're hunting for within the lubricants area. Let me talk about the vehicles just a moment. Power density. What do I mean by power density? How much power can you get out of any given vehicle? This tracks it over time. Numbers generated, this is just kind of a, a, a market average. Power density is important. If you're developing more power out of an engine the size of a football, physics says it's going to be hotter. So, you can't uh, constantly drive down the size of engines and expect there to be no repercussions on how severe the engines are. So what we see is, and I'm in 1980, so if you pick something like a, a Volkswagen Golf, but 1980 had a 
power output about 60 horsepower. 60 horsepower. Man, I can almost do that on my road bike. But now we're talking about 250 from a vehicle that is normally, normally the same size of uh, engine. So you're using about a 1.8 liter engine here. But some of the vehicles now, there's uh, Ford EcoBoost, one liter engine, I think they're rated up to I don't know, about 165 brake horsepower, something ludicrous. So if you do that in power density terms, it's about four times what it was, where is it? way up here, four times what it was back in the uh, 1980s. That means it's hotter, it's more challenging for the lubricant as a reactor than it was before. Hotter, dirtier, faster, the engine running tighter, the more precise, far more challenging. There's a lot of turbocharging. There's cars with four turbochargers rolling about our roads. V8 engines with twin turbos on either bank of the engine. There's little cars, little dinky little cars that have two turbochargers. Some have a supercharger and a turbocharger. Doesn't matter what those are, but it's all about trying to increase the power. It doesn't come for free. It makes the engine farm or the lubricant far more challenged than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And that's what we have to deal with. But why are they doing that? Why are they driving down the size of the engine and the power output up? Because if you can make the same power output from an engine that's smaller, you don't have to drag about that half the size of the engine in the vehicle. You reduce the weight of the vehicle and the vehicle becomes more efficient. It becomes more efficient, you reduce the CO2 from the tailpipe. So again, it's driving down the tailpipe emissions. That's what's uh, creating all the challenges in our industry. So, talk about Afton. I was talking general terms before. What did we try and do? Again, this is me being a, a research scientist. I want a good tool. I want a tool to do my research in. We didn't have one. We didn't have to our, uh, I know, you should be embarrassed. We didn't have a great research tool. We made do with things. So these, uh, these tests I described, MTM Slim, HFRR, all these little bench tests, they're great. You can run. 20 of them in a day if you have enough time and enough people. Easy. And it's quite cheap. But as I said, how relevant is that to how much CO2 is getting pumped out of the tailpipe of your car? Directionally, absolutely. But it's not a direct line. I can't say, oh, this is better by 10%, so your CO2 is better by 10%. It's not that simple. But what you can do, you can do some research in... Um, these emissions testing cells, and this is exactly what the, the government stipulates that car manufacturers test their vehicles in. They actually measure the gases that come out of the tailpipe. You could do that. It's really relevant because it's exactly what you're trying to, uh, you're trying to change, but you can't really use it as a research tool. It's slow. It's costly. And honestly, it's not the most reproducible uh, of uh, research tools. And in the middle, you have these tests that weren't described before. These standard tests that are in a cell and they run in a constant way. They're good, but it's one engine. We all don't drive the same car. Different cars, different engines, different driving styles. They're all, comp all compromised. So we wanted a better tool. So this is what we've done. We took a vehicle. It's a rolling road, so a big drum. Car never moves, but this drum spins around and uh, captures the energy. So we run this vehicle against a very, very tightly controlled drive cycle by a robot. We've got a robot driver that uh, it doesn't look like Terminator. It's just a bunch of sticks. <laughs> but it controls the throttle, the gear changes, and a uh, very, very precise uh, way of driving a vehicle. Interestingly, if you get a really, really good driver, human driver, they're as good, if not better, 
in the robot, but this runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a bit of a tough shift to give somebody. So we use a, a robot driver. And these are different drive cycles. That one there's a European one, we've got different North American ones here. And what we do is, because we run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we generate one data point every second, we get a huge amount of data. And the data we're collecting is essentially the measurement of torque from the engine. We're measuring how much uh, energy is uh, getting released to the wheels. What we then do is some really high power statistics. And we generate from that analysis what the emissions of the vehicle is. It's a real world driving cycle. So that makes it really, really relevant We can see how fuel economy changes over the cycle of from when you put it in fresh into the vehicle to when you take it out at the end of your 10,000 mile oil drain. We're not stuck to one vehicle. I'm sure you data points in a minute, but that, that's a Honda. We've used dozens of different vehicles and they all respond differently. If you want a, the really, really best fuel economy, you've got to design the lubricant for the vehicle. It's not really practical, but you can get close to it. And there's examples again with uh, Ford and BP and Shell with um, Gordon, help me, the, oh, forgotten his name, Gordon Wilson, thank you very much, yes I knew you were going to come here for a reason, <laughs> the, uh, these are desi designing a lubricant specifically for that vehicle and you get really really good fuel economy performance but you know, there's so many variants it's difficult to do but we can actually do that work and we've done that work several times in different vehicles. I said continuous operation, data rich. What it allows us to do is, oops, this one, down this bottom right hand corner, this is a correlation of the EPA window sticker. So this is the North American emissions numbers that the car manufacturers are held to. And if they go over numbers, they get uh, severe fines like millions, millions. And this is the numbers that Afton have generated in our test. And it's 98% correlation. Okay, woohoo, that's great. Why is it great? I generate these numbers in two days. Each car, two days. This number here takes months to generate for the car manufacturer. That allows me to look at not quite infinite, but many, many, many different formulation changes, ways of optimizing the lubricant to really optimize this performance. So, why am I so excited about it? It allows me to do great research and develop better chemistry. So getting the right tool for the job enables us to do good research. Let me tell you about some of the numbers. What we did was essentially map, we call bumper to bumper, but how we map out the fuel economy in different areas of the engine. We have a baseline here, that's the zero point. ATF, automatic transmission fluid. So that's a fluid that's in your gearbox in an automatic car. Engine oil, that's all in the engine. And this is the fuel uh, effect from additive. So we actually change the fluid in the gearbox, we change the fluid in the engine together and then we've changed the fuel that we're using to optimize the uh, fuel economy performance. And this is what we see. 2.1% benefit versus, and as you say, the baseline is kind of a, um, a semi-current technology in all these cases. 2.1% for ATF, for your gearbox. Another 3.1% for your engine oil, brings it to 5.2, and then you get another uh, boost, 1.5% or so from the fuel. 6.8% fuel economy benefit. Okay, that doesn't sound an awful lot. It'd be great if it was much, much bigger. You get really excited. Car manufacturers get really excited when you talk about numbers bigger than one. Why is that? Let me let's forget about 
6.8% or 7% because you know, that was an experiment, idealized conditions. Being more modest, let's just pick 1% and that's attainable easily. Global energy consumption, 1% reduction across the world. That's a bunch, a bunch of fuel that you save. CO2, 16.9, almost 17 million metric tons of CO2 from 1%. What does that mean for every man and his dog? Well, not the dog, doesn't drive. 28 euros a year. It's okay. I have 28 euros in my pocket. And for the car manufacturers, 1.7 billion euros a year versus the 2020 targets that uh, the European Commission has set out for the car manufacturers. People sit up and listen for 1.7 billion, I would, 1.7 billion euros, and that's just 1%. The challenge to delivering that has been we haven't had a tool to really show how the research gets through to the end user. And that's one of the exciting parts of what we did uh, to enable that at, at Afton. So just to close, fuel economy, tailpipe emissions, we can make a difference. We have to make a difference. We have to do something. We, we can. There is a way of doing that. We can do that by enabling the OEMs. We can do that by changing how we use uh, our chemistry to get better lubricants. We believe we've got a good test that allow us to do that. So we're quite smug, but you know, it's something that we're working with our partners uh, as best we can. What's interesting is it allow us to quantify the way that chemistry can impact the tailpipe emissions. Unless you can do that, you're kind of guessing, and you get to the end of the, the process and you've guessed wrong, it's a long way back. We try and put some intermediary stepping stones along the way. And this is undoubtedly the biggest challenge and the most important challenge that we have in our industry. I would say about 90% of the research time and effort and resources in my team, but also the organization, I would say the industry at large, is aimed at reducing CO2 emissions. We take it seriously. The industry, when people think about CO2 emissions, cars, they're right in the forefront of people's minds. So, I hope I've shown you that there is a lot of chemistry, a lot of technology within the uh, lubricants within your car. It's not just brown goo. There's actually chemicals in there. We put them in there for a purpose. They're designer fluids. If you have a BMW or you have a VW, you probably have a different fluid in there. For a very, very good reason, they're different cars. You only get the success when you're working across disciplines. Chemists, engineers, tribologists, rheologists, marketers. It's important. It is a mature area, but don't let that put you off. And looking at the younger people in the audience, this is a really exciting, you don't have to come and work for us, but this is a really exciting part of chemistry. People don't see it. It's brown, it's sticky. There are a huge amount of challenges because what are we doing? We're reducing CO2. I don't think there's many industries, if you take the automotive and the associated industries, have a bigger impact to play on the world than uh, that industry. And we have a big part to play. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much for your attention. Well done. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. A very broad coverage. And I'm sure there's some questions. Um, oh. Aha. <laughs> I'm going to have to use mine. Okay. <laughs> Afterwards. I promised I wouldn't ask you a question, actually. See, he knows too much. <laughs> Skeletons and closets and all that here. <laughs> Shall we start at the front here?
Thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, a question actually from a friend, a colleague who can't be here. He has a marine engine, it's a diesel, and it's, came, it's about eight years old, and it came specifically with instructions not to use multi-grade oil in it. And he doesn't know why and asked me to ask you. Any idea? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of ideas. Um, I guess there's, you, you're now semi-expert. We know we put polymers in there uh, to make these multi-grade oils, 5W30, 15W40. That's what it means by multi-grade. A monograde doesn't change its viscosity as you change time. So there's no polymer in there. So running a marine engine, uh, it's usually running at a, a more constant conditions for a longer time. You don't have many uh, heating up and cooling down uh, issues. It's going to be better for the, the cleanliness of the vehicle. But no, I, specifically, I don't know what marine engine it is that he has. Is it a... Uh, there are certain benefits of having a, a, a monograde. If it's running at constant conditions, you don't need a multigrade because it doesn't need to be hot and it doesn't need to be cold. You're always at the same conditions. So I guess if it's uh, perhaps just due to conditions of its use. <laughs> a user call line. <laughs> uh, I'd like to talk about something you didn't mention, and oh. that is what happens when the oil has been used? Is there some way of disposing of it? Is there some prescribed way? And uh, how much of it can be recycled? What a very, very insightful question. Thank you very much. So an awful lot more than it currently is, is the answer to your question. A lot of the, uh, the challenges around how to dispose of it can be taken away if you reuse it. Now, there are ways of taking used oil, and it's called re-refining. These develop, were developed, I guess, about 50 years ago, but it hasn't really come to the fore until maybe 10 years ago, and it's become more and more popular. In North America, about 20% of the fluids are actually based off re-refined Maybe not 20%, maybe 10%. Special, quite a big specialist yeah. company, yeah. aren't they? Growing yeah. fast. And they are large. They're not the size of the refining uh, organizations that you see in the rest of the world. They are smaller, but that ultimately is how you would reuse it. You get about 80% you know, of the fluid back out. It's relatively energy intensive, so when you do a CO2 balance, I'm not quite sure how it works out, but... You can actually reuse them, but it's, it means essentially breaking it back to its constituent parts and building it back up again uh, in a, essentially a, a refining process. Okay. Um, can I just ask a question about, does it make any difference where, given there are two types of the gear car and the automatic car, does that cause any impact on your focus of research in terms of uh, lubricant efficiency? Again, there's research, so we would call that, so by giving me like a manual, yeah. manual versus automatic. There's research in both areas. Um, that's largely driven by different markets of different needs. I think they're ultimately, and whether it's in my lifetime or not, I don't know, automatic transmissions are really where it's going to be, but they're far more complex. Um, they can be more uh, fuel efficient, but they're generally heavier, but more complicated. It's be very, you know, I can't see how somewhere like Africa that you'd have an automatic transmission because it just costs too much, but a low cost vehicle, Manual is probably where it's be. So there's different reasons why you have both, both types, but there is research in both. I had an example of automatic transmission because uh, the research we were doing, it just fitted more nicely. But manual transmission also exists, and it will continue to exist. Hi there. Um, most of what you talked about in this talk was based on automotive lubricants. How much of what you said can be applied to, say, an industrial lubricant in terms of the properties you were talking about? And also, which do you think is more important in terms of CO2 reduction for the next few years? Again, an insightful question. Um, 
many of the properties that we uh, are challenged by in automotive are duplicated industrial. Some are not, and there's some additional ones in the industrial side, but where is the primary one that uh, sticks out. And that's probably more challenged in the industrial area than it is in uh, the automotive. Um, again, automotive is perhaps a more, uh, could be it's something you get your arms round more easily than industrial. Industrial, there's just a plethora of different technology and requirements that you need to uh, address, whether it's slideways, whether it's uh, hydraulics or gears. Or so there's a lots of different unique uh, application. But where is the one that definitely sticks out is one that's uh, most common. The, the importance, I would say engineering is more important because I'm an engineering R&D director, but I think in terms of CO2, the impact is clearly going to be on the, the automotive side. Can I of course. add to that? I, mean, I shouldn't really. Um, of course you can. Automotive is definitely the first focus for fuel efficiency and saving energy because, as you say, there's a lot of them and they're all much the same. But it's now moving into lots of other areas. I mean, in the world, there are something like 80 billion, is it 80 billion or 800 billion rolling element bearings, you know, in electronic machines and washing machines and so on. If you could, sa if you could reduce the friction by 1%, you'd save almost as much as you save in automotive, and that's starting now with better greases and better lubricants in. So, so it's a, there are a lot of, it, it started with engines because yeah. of legislation, but it's now moved globally over all sorts of engineering components. Okay, excellent. Now there was a question? Yes, that's right. Um, back in the uh, 1950s, I ran this, uh, two-stroke scooter, and uh, as you know, um, you mix the petrol and oil together. And I've got to use this stuff called molybdenum disulfide, and uh, there were others, but according to the makers, uh, you reduce your oil mix by two-thirds, and also, you permanently coated the part for the graphite-like substance. Um, I must say, I, I read the hell out of this little motor. <laughs> I never had any problems with it. So, uh, is it still used? Thank you. That's a question that's very dear to my heart. And you're absolutely right. Uh, Molly disulfide is used as a solid uh, lubricant for many years. Solids, as I've shown you, solids don't go very well in, in, in lubricants and oil. So what the industry has developed are molybdenum sulfur-based uh, species that are oil-soluble, but under the conditions of the, the vehicle, decompose and depose molybdenum disulfide layers on the metal. So that chemistry is absolutely still in use within uh, automotive industry. In fact, molly disulfide is still used within greases, mm. So you still get molly uh, in there. And the reason it's close to my heart is because that's a version of that chemistry was the first uh, molecule that I developed when I joined this industry back way back when. So it's a very good, uh, potent chemistry. I didn't, it was one of the ones when I said, and there's a lot of other ones, it was in that category. I could have bored you for hours with that one too. Thank you. Uh, there was a question here, yes. Uh, you mentioned about the, um, the calcium carbonate uh, mm -hmm. as an additive. Why is it that that doesn't lead to, um, to some abrasion? Or is it that you do get abrasion, but it's too insignificant uh, to merit, See, to, to matter, rather? I think you've tricked me and got so many experts in here. <laughs> Again, another excellent question. Absolutely right, you do get that. Um, be it with calcium, magnesium, you get different surface uh, properties with each of those uh, detergents. You, again, I'm again, standing <laughs> next to a world <laughs> expert here, I, so I'm it's embarrassing. It. But <laughs> there's, yeah. for, first of all, it's not like taking a piece of metal and rubbing up against another piece of metal. These are like really tiny, tiny particles. So they are on the micro scale. They do uh, erode uh, the, the surface bit 
we have other additives that are described that are actually deposed on the surface of the, the metal. So the first thing they're going to do is actually interact with, with those, so not the metal itself. It's, it does happen, it's controlled, and as you rightly said, it's insignificant really compared with, if you get catastrophic wear in the engine, you, know, you see, I've really shown you parts like grooving in the metal. So it's, uh, it's something that does happen, but it's controlled. I mean, the particles, are, I mean, calcium carbonate is quite soft. Yeah. It's chalk, effectively, <laughs> except the, particle, the, the, the particles are only, what, 20 nanometers yeah, in diameter, yeah. typically. And they're amorphous. Skin, yeah. So yeah. they don't normally, they're not hard enough to wear steel no. or iron parts mm. normally, but they, they do erode the, 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 wear the, the films film. on, the, on the parts. But it's a hot topic, actually, okay. as you probably know. <laughs> Yes. Um, I used to change the oil in my vehicle from 1953 to 1999. I'm now driving a computer, which is decent. Mm. Um, but when I started, you used to be buying oil in five gallon drums back mm. then along the coast. And apparently, it lasted forever. Now, apparently, oil doesn't last forever. So when I tried to give away the oil that I was. <coughs> Um, <coughs> yes, it's absolutely true. You must buy more oil and more additives <laughs> more frequently. <laughs> yeah, I think there's... It will go off, if you will, over a certain amount of time. And typically, we would use... Say, there's a shelf life, you know, two, three years, that's the type of thing. Is that conservative? Yeah, it probably is. Probably but, conservative. But, but if it was designed 15 years ago... Well, that I was coming yeah, at that. Yeah. Whereas, if you go back when you said several years uh, ago, there were far less additives in the oil. So there's far less things to go wrong, far less things to drop out. Um, one of the things you would find if, in oil that kind of had gone off, there's quite often... You can't see it's in a metal can or a plastic can. You'll get sediment coming out or some kind of uh, sedimentation. That happens because, I said, there's so much chemistry in there and it's a little bit more on the edge, as we say. Yeah. But I guess as you were intimating, yeah. if you go back 40 years, far less additives yeah. in there, there's far less stuff to go wrong. But it's much, much lower performance lubricant than the one you're enjoying now. Oil with one or two additives, basically, mm -hmm. with anti-wear agent and uh, maybe a smidge of detergent. That's about it. So it worked fine in a 1950s car, but it wouldn't work in a yeah. 2000 car. Yeah. Not for long, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Another one. Yeah. It's Sorry to ask a second question. Mm. But, on no, this but that's your question. The first one was your friend's. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is my question. Uh, on the same subject, um, I've got a car that's 60 years old, and I've been although I change, the oil that I use is modern oil, but um, you don't put um, the same oil as a modern car. Mm. You put a, a, a special oil in, which is less, uh, less mm. complicated. Now, mm. you would have thought that um, it would be better to put a modern oil in an old engine. Have you any idea why you don't? I think there's a number of things. The first one that comes to mind would be the viscosity of the oil is likely vastly different. Many oils, now you see vehicles will be, as I said, 5W30 was on my schematic there. You're probably using a far, far thicker oil. It's most likely a monograde. So th there's one reason why you would use an older style of car. You can still <coughs> get those uh, lubricants available in the market, but it's going to be in Africa or mm -hmm. Middle East or China. Um, so I guess that's, that's one reason why you'd want to have uh, that older style of lubricant. It's also, I mean, possibly the bearing materials will be different, and yeah. the new engine oils might not, might, More aggressive. might be too aggressive for yeah. them. Yes, I have one um, question here from 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 the web, um, and it's from Philip Hunt, I think, and he says, um, unfortunately, he won't be able to make it. He'd love to make it, but he'd be interested to know Ian Bell's views on how oils. Um, 
are coping with um, the new high fuel economy, internal combustion engines, particularly the fact that they tend to be operating at much higher speeds. I think there's no risk okay. to um, engine again, speeds, uh, RPMs. Not, yeah, okay. um, again, another good question. That kind of talks again to that question of power density. The, uh, mm -hmm. the, engine, the modern engines are far more powerful, even though they're much smaller. It means the engine's running considerably hotter. So I guess uh, the things that the, the lubricants are doing differently, they're dealing with uh, much higher temperatures, so far more oxidation can occur. Everyone knows 10 degrees and the, the, the ratio of increase in reaction. Oxidation is important, so we can control that through additives. It's running hotter, so it's getting dirtier. We control that through dispersants and detergents yeah. uh, and the viscosity of the oil. But I guess the, the thing that answers the question more succinctly is, and I should have thought of this first, that oils are designed to work with those vehicles and those mm -hmm. engines. So it isn't the same oil that you're using with these newer engines as you were using okay, six years ago, but even 10 years ago. These oils wouldn't be good for mm. those. Yes, one, another question here in the middle. I think we've got another couple of minutes, a couple more questions, so we have to this one. Sorry, thanks. Uh, that was a very interesting lecture, and this question just follows on from the previous question. Could you give us any indication as to the temperature range that we're looking at for stability of these uh, lubricant oils, given that in places like Montreal and Moscow, in places like that, startup temperatures in the mornings are going to be pretty cold, and then progressing on to what sort of typical temperatures are we looking at whenever the engine's hot and running? The typical temperatures that one would see in the sump, by the sump, you have a, I don't have a picture, the sump, the bottom of the engine, where the oil normally sits in a, in a wet sump vehicle, the temperature will get up to maybe 120, 115 degrees Celsius. However, when the, the oil is, say, in a piston, I'm going to find something, this is closed, then that's a piston going up and down in the, uh, in the block, you have rings, piston rings that uh, seal the, the piston. The lubricant actually does flow around the back of these rings. That's seen temperatures, I don't know, 320, 350, 370 degrees Celsius, but for a very short time. Residence time is very short. It's also getting sprayed up into the bottom of the, uh, the piston to the undercrown area. That's about 250 degrees. Again, there's yeah, an expert engineers I know in the room here that more specific, but that's the range of temperatures that you would see. Um, so you're right, from minus 40 at startup, uh, you're seeing quite a gradient over the course of maybe like 10 minutes up to that kind of high temperature. But routinely, uh, the bulk of it would seen about 120. Piston. I think, I think coffee and biscuits are calling. Oh, oh one more. Last question. Oh, there, sorry, there was, oh, there was two. But. Two there, okay. When I change my oil, I take the old oil to the garage and pour it in their tank. They have somebody who comes and collects it and pays for it. How much of that old oil gets cleaned and sold again, resold again? So, so how much? How much of that old oil gets cleaned and resold again? In all honesty, I don't know specifically with that, uh, that, that garage, clearly. In... Europe, re-refined base stocks are relatively small part of the market. So on average, you're talking about like single digit percents. But it's increasing. In North America, as I said, it's 10, 15 percent of the market is re-refined base stocks. So it's something that's changing. It's more recent uh, technology that's allowing them to do it. And uh, again, it, when the price of oil goes up, Re-refined base stocks become far more uh, attractive business case for people to invest in. So the price is up just now. People are investing in re-refined base stocks. And so uh, it uh, will, will increase, although it's mm. unfortunately a small percentage right now. I mean, the rest presumably is burnt in 
fast. Yeah, actually, yeah, they use it as, uh, as a fuel. fuel. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's not, it's power, not power generation. It's, too early. it's yeah. actually an energy source, so they won't. Yeah. I mean, the big problem is how to persuade individuals not to dispose of it yeah. improperly, and there's a lot of public campaigns about yeah. that, particularly in Europe. One more question. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you for your talk. Um, this is a question about uh, uh, sort of dual fuel vehicles and how mm -hmm. these oils would function in those. I mean, do you do you do research into these? Yeah. Um, there's by dual fuel we mean um, LPG. Uh, LPG and PEL. It's we do. There's uh, and certain differences clearly between the, the fuels. LPG is very clean. It's a really clean fuel. You can actually get away with less additives and, uh, than for a regular uh, hydrocarbon, uh, liquid hydrocarbon fuel. Excuse me. But the two are not uh, mutually exclusive. There's actually about 89% overlap in what they require. So you end up with uh, a system that you can actually change very slightly to cover LPG needs uh, or these uh, gaseous fuel needs. So it's not so challenging. Yeah, diesels, I think the engineering is actually much harder than uh, with, with gasoline. So the, it's actually the engine that limits that. But again, we have gasoline and diesel requirements in the same lubricant in Europe. In North America, they don't have that challenge. They just make uh, sort of petrol. Uh, based or uh, petrol driven vehicle uh, lubricants. So it's yeah, a sliding scale of complexity, but uh, it's not, as I said, they're not mutually exclusive, so we can deal with that. A more challenging one is in Brazil, where Ethanol. all the cars are flex fuel, so you can either put gasoline or hydrated, eth well, it's 95% ethanol in your car. Yeah. And the lubricant then has to be able to cope with quite different. Yeah. And presumably, you, you get involved in that. Yeah, and there's other that gets in other niceties of uh, <laughs> more physical properties. Mm. Um, but yeah, we do. All of these trends are the things that drive our research, and do a lot of uh, work you know, ourselves and clearly with our uh, customers and OEM partners, looking five, ten, fifteen, twenty years in the future to help drive our research. So. These are the type of things that you know, we're perhaps developing now. We're thinking about uh, a number of years in the, in the past. Okay, I think we're done. Thank, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank you. Again. Thank you very much. So, well, I, hope, I hope you now know some of these slippery secrets that uh, are no longer secret. Thank yeah. you. I've got more slippery ones. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry. Post, post talk trauma. Yeah. Ah. Oh. A few sensible.